Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets annual calendar reading. My name is Jennifer, and I'm a librarian with the Milwaukee Public Library. MPL is very happy to once again collaborate with the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets to offer this program this year in a new virtual format. Um, a couple of quick technical notes before we start. For all of our attendees, all of your webcams are off and your microphones are muted. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions box and either myself or my behind the scenes colleague Lydia will address those there. Also, um, while you will hear from all 23 of our poets today, you may not see them. Some of them don't have webcams. So if that is the case, instead of seeing their webcam, you'll see just an informational slide on the screen that has information about today's program. I think that's it on the technical side. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, MPL's literature librarian, Dan Kontowski. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Kentowski. I've, I've uh, communicated with the majority of you in the past, and um, it's always an honor for me to do this every year. I, I honestly, truly do believe in the library sponsoring and helping out the poets in this city because um, I think it really adds to the culture of everybody in southeastern Wisconsin. And um, I also want to say that the library does offer a lot of other programs, and we've had some poets on, I think, last week um, from a different program. And uh, so if you take some time, look at the mpl.org's website, and uh, there might be some other programs that you might find interesting during this time when we're all shut in. There's stuff from, from um, sewing, and there's all kinds of programs we're doing online now that we used to do in person. So. Uh, thanks for attending this. I always enjoy hearing your poetry. And uh, hopefully next year we can do this in person because I appreciate all the books that I've created over the years. Believe me, I've added every one of those books to our collection. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again in person next year. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our real host, Ed. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. And thanks, Jennifer. Um, Welcome everyone. Uh, I apologize for my webcam not working. It may pop on at any minute. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, what, I want to start out before we call the readers to the podium, uh, just to give a little bit of a, uh, a history of the calendar. The Wisconsin Poets calendar was started in 1982 by Two poets, uh, Tom and Mary Montag, and that was before the fellowship uh, took over the uh, the, the uh, responsibility for publishing the count uh, the calendar. So Tom and Mary uh, put out a Wisconsin poets calendar for three years, 82, 83, and 84, and then in 85 and 86 there was no poets calendar, and in 87 the fellowship uh, took over the publication of the Wisconsin Poets Calendar, and it's been published every year since then. And it's edited by a different editor or editors uh, every year. Uh, they volunteer with the fellowship to edit uh, the calendar, and it's a, it's a lot of work, I can say that, because I've done it myself in the past. And uh, so I really appreciate all the, the the poets in the fellowship who have taken on the responsibility of editing uh, the calendar. Uh, and speaking of the calendar, uh, because it's so much work and because there's so many poems to sort through and and uh, organize and so much design work that goes into the calendar, submissions are due uh, way in advance, as many of you know. And in fact, the submissions for the 2022 calendar uh, are open now, and they will close on February 1st. So please uh, take a moment to go to the website, wfop.org, and uh, look under the uh, 
the resources button for the calendar, and then on that page you'll see the submission guidelines for the 2022 calendar and get your submissions in prior to February 1st. The 2022 calendar will be edited by uh, Susie Wedward, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, and Jane Osipowski. And uh, you'll find that information on, on the website. Uh, a little bit of the history of this reading. I first read at the calendar reading at the uh, Milwaukee Public Library in either 2009 or 2010. That was before I was the regional vice president. Uh, Janet Leahy and Carolyn Vargo were co-regional reps at that time, and they were instrumental in starting the partnership with the library uh, for these annual readings. And it's uh, it's one of my favorite events every year. Um, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully it'll continue for a long time in the future, and hopefully next year we'll be back in the beautiful uh, rare books room at the library. So with that, I'm going to just give again uh, for the attendees a little information about what's going to happen. The the go-to webinar room for presenters is is limited, so there are only 24 people in the room. So, and since Dan is in the room, uh, we, we, in theory, will have 23 uh, poets reading today, and I will call them in order. They will say their name, where they're from, read their poem, and if they brought a second poem, uh, they will go right ahead and read their second poem, or they can read the second poem and then their calendar poem. I don't care what order they read them. That's up to them. Uh, and then when they're finished reading, I will introduce the, the next reader. We're going to read in the order that the poems uh, appear in the 2021 calendar. And hopefully this will go smoothly. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, I'll read my second poem at the end, and then we'll close up, uh, we'll close up today's event. So the, the first reader is uh, the Poet Laureate of Sheboygan, and her name is Lisa Theo. So take it away, Lisa. Thank you, Ed. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to start with my poem that's in the calendar. It's called House or Home. Some might say that home is not a place, but rather a well of memory. The smells of cinnamon, fried onions, and rising bread. All the flavors of loving kindness, savored in the heart, forever blessed. Ask the one who flees, ask the one sleeping in the doorway, what is home? It starts with four walls and a roof of straw, brick, or tin. A place to be safe, to be within, and thus to make a life. A sanctuary. And for my second poem, I'll read a, uh, a poem about my house that I, I got to know my house very well during COVID time. Still getting to know it. It's the poem is called Keeping House. I never really knew my house until I lived inside all day, every day. What used to be a rushing to get to the next shiny place has become a marathon of solitude as I wait for bread to rise. My heart beats in sync with the ice maker in my fridge, the sump pump in my basement, the ceiling fan above my head. My bookshelves are sagging under the weight of pending knowledge. I have learned to measure time by the angle of light on the floor. How is it that once upon a time I ran around town scattered and maskless, breathing in what everyone else was breathing out? Now I sit in stillness, grateful to earn my living from home, privy to the persistence of mildew and the advice of the air conditioner. I have come to know doorknobs and breadcrumbs, dead leaves fallen from my house plants, and all the maligned secrets of dust bunnies. Sympathetic to the tea kettle's sorrow, 
I bear witness to the confessions of my carpet. I am not a better housekeeper, just a better house knower. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, I neglected one thing in my introduction. Um, it, we usually sell calendars at this event, uh, and I do have a very few copies of the calendar <clears throat> available here for sale. And uh, Jennifer hopefully will put my email address into the chat box. And if you're interested, you can email me later on and we'll figure out how I'm going to get you one of these uh, one of these calendars. There also may be some available on the WFOP uh, website, WFOP.org. So we're going to continue now with our second reader, uh, who is uh, Mary Jo Balistrieri. So go ahead, Mary Jo. Thank you, Ed. Um, my name is Joe Bellastrary. I'm from Waukesha, and this is my poem that I wrote to my husband, Sanctuary. When I was undergoing radiation therapy, my husband asked one night before sleep, where do you feel most at home? You are my home, I replied. You are my home. It wasn't our 30-year-old brick home filled with expressions and extensions of us, our architectural dream that brought the outside in. It wasn't even the book-lined shelves or the grand piano and harpsichord I thought were my life. It wasn't the art collection or travel, not even the children. It was all of these and it was none of these. In our most terrifying moment, when we spoke of dying, the word home was distilled to its essence. You, my home, was your love. Thank you, Ed, and I will read one more from Paula Schultz, who lives in Slinger, Wisconsin. Where we go. Something of the trees wants, makes me want to bolt from the house, grab keys, ride where current carries. I think I adore the reckless wind because my childhood elms could sky glide fearlessly, loving the air like a sail. I longed to be weightless, jump with eyes closed, mail myself into tomorrow, be bold, and seeing the street lights on, hurry home. 50 years my parents lived in that house, leaving only when dad's walker couldn't pass through the narrow halls. All the elms long gone. I still love the gusty rush of air on my face, but more and more, I look for the arcing light overhead and the door to where I belong. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was great. Uh, our next reader is uh, DeWitt Clinton. Hello, everyone. I live near Lake Michigan and uh, in the village of Shorewood. And these two poems are that I'll be reading will be uh, reflective of that. Have you been on Lincoln Memorial Drive? Pausing briefly in a moment of fog. Yesterday, pushing up a hill in fog, fog lights of drivers keeping me to the right. I hear behind me the lovely honking of visiting geese who fly along the coastline just below the fog. When they pass over, I turn and look up, careful to watch for falling fecal matter that would ruin everything. So perfect. Canadians on their way home, fog that keeps all of us in silence, the hill that still needs to be ascended, and then it all disappears. And no moment like this will ever come by like the friend it has been, lonely, disappearing. I read from a second 
a poem from a new book, uh, which is available at Boswell and Woodland Pattern. It's called By a Lake Near a Moon, Fishing with the Chinese Masters. These are poems adapted from classical Chinese poets. This poem is from Du Fu. Overcast skies, gloomy gray matter, restless, I don't want to do anything. So what does Du Fu do on a day like today with his dawn over the mountains? The snow in our city falls and falls and falls and falls and falls, turning all from gray to white, white to gray, gray, gray. Sometimes even the buildings are lost in the fog and gray. Each night a hard freeze keeps all in frozen February. I have not seen wild turkeys or red foxes or even a doe. Only the busy chatter of English sparrows, black crows, and a sky of gulls, gulls, gulls. Thank you. Thank you, Duet. Uh, my poem is next in the calendar, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to read the the poem. It's called A Remembrance. Forty acres bordered by ditches and woods. A dirt lane meets a narrow blacktop road. A yard of birch, clump birch, daffodils, forsythia, pussy willow. A rose trellis. In the front room, a sepia wedding portrait, left palm Sunday fronds behind the frame. Bitter sweet and wheat stalk in a hall bass on the piano. A cedar lined closet, woolen coat, a feathered fedora. In the kitchen, birchwood cabinet, a porcelain sink with drain boards. Percolator on the stove, Arthur Godfrey on the radio, Grace by Enstrom over the table. In the bedroom, mom's knackered brush and comb, dad's tortoiseshell shoehorn, a statue of the infant of Prague, a picture of Our Lady of Perpetual Health, a rosary on each light stand, the faint echo of prayer. So the next reader is Sister Irene Zimmerman. Go ahead, Sister. I can't hear you. Oh, Can you hear me? Now we can. Sister, can you start now. over again? Yeah, please start over. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sister Irene Zimmerman from Greenfield, Wisconsin. And my poem is called Nest Hunting. This rainy morning, a pair of mallards swam on the new pond that appeared overnight in the middle of our lawn then waddled up to our house to check out a nesting place. The drake wandered over to the peonies, while the hen headed intently toward the shrubbery near the patio wall where a mallard had made a nest a year ago. Was this that same hen? Or was she one of the dozen ducklings that had safely hatched beneath the sheltering shrubs last spring? Were its leaves waving welcome home to her? Their inspection completed, the two lovers waddled off together, quacking things over. 
My second poem is from my book called Where God is at Home. And the name of the poem is Foul Fidelity at 5 a.m. The setting is at Retreat Center up in Beatty's Harbor. I woke to the rooster's crow, a task given long ago to his ancestral clay, and wondered, though he'll never renege on his faithful din, being untouched by original sin, does he ever, in some rooster way, long for a rainy day so that he can sleep in? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Irene. The next reader is Barb Geiger. Hello, everyone. My name is Barb Geiger. I live in Waukesha, Wisconsin. My poem in the calendar is similar to Sister Irene's in that it is about a nest, but it's a different kind of nest. It's about an empty nest. And the title is Empty Nest. From my perch on the bed in my son's vacant room, I gaze through the seasons at the fenced backyard where years ago I watched him play. Crabapple buds burst into delicate blooms. House sparrows flitter. Bits of thatch straggling from overstuffed beaks, expectantly lining nest boxes for family additions. Berries redden once blossoms fade. Tag team parents come and go, foraging overtime to nourish their growing broods. Young babes, wings barely tested, are gone too soon. Fallen leaves transform grass to a carpet of gold. I clean out the houses for next year's residents and wonder, do house sparrows grieve empty nests too? That poem, um, the editors put in the calendar right the week after Mother's Day. So thank you for that. Um, my second poem is about home, but it's not about Waukesha, Wisconsin. It's called Transience, and it's about a five-month trip my husband and I took on the Mississippi River, um, which is documented in a memoir um, called Paddle for a Purpose. But the poem is called Transience. Ripples trace our hull and vanish astern, leaving no hint of our fleeting presence. Cradled in Mother Nature's arms, we surrender to the river's will russet leaves lazily drifting alongside. White tails peek from aspen groves as we pass. Statues of stick-legged herons watch with golden eyes. Tufted mergansers dive, resurfacing well out of reach. Wary of our presence, they know us only as the transient neighbors we are. Mighty bald eagle escorts spread powerful wings and soar ahead. Accompaniment, a show of unity. Inevitably, we will reach the sea. But in this moment, we are home. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Well, for whatever reason, my webcam has chosen to start working. So I don't know if people can see me, but I can see myself now. Um, the next reader is uh, Jim Landwehr. Hi, my name is Jim Landwehr. I'm from Waukesha, Wisconsin, and my poem uh, is based on homes uh, or home, past, present, and future. It's called Where Is It? I lived in it, then left it, relocated it, remade it, established it, became accustomed to it, eventually went back to it, visited it, missed it, talked of it, longed for it appreciated it, but realized it was no longer home. So that is my home poem. Uh, the second poem is from my collection, Thoughts from a Line at the DMV, which came out in 2019. And uh, it's titled Brash, and it's uh, based on a couple of women in my life, not my wife, uh, I might add, but um, it's titled Brash. 
Her voice is a blend of bagpipes, fireworks, and a locomotive pileup. It matches her personality, a mix of salt and vinegar, jalapenos and bleach. She scorches like a tire fire burning in Cleveland, spreading her action passion for purpose and meaning, like a Jehovah's Witness at the doorstep of my life. She dresses in fashion that is part gypsy, a healthy dose of lion tamer, with a dash of bluegrass fiddler. Her clothes shout, pay attention to me. Makeup is not her thing. There is no part of her that is made up. She's as real as lemon drops and toll booths in the San Francisco fog. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. The next reader is Terry Walters. Thanks, Ed. I'm Terry Walters from Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. I enjoy writing memoir, and this um, poem actually started its life as a memoir piece. It's called The Island. 1970, reporting to naval duty. Young, newlywed, possessions packed into a car. Midwesterners, we hadn't even known Georgia had a coast. Paint peeling shaft tall, proud pine, then winding through marshes to the island. Dunes, spiraling seagrass, long, wide, white beach, immense space, sky huge and blue, sunlit water, long-legged birds playing with crashing waves, salty spray, wind roaring, hearts filling. Didn't know we would walk this beach for hours, talking, planning, growing, drive off island late one night, return as a family of three, stroll in soft twilight, the ocean lulling a baby to sleep. Didn't know he would someday yearn for this place, returning in reality and daydreams, pulled by the tides. Thank you. Thank you, Cherry. The next reader today is Elizabeth Park. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Park. I live on Browns Lake in Burlington. My calendar poem is entitled Premonition. As the baby's cry seeped through the dusty window screens, and the telephone's ring clamored through the old plaster walls. As the workday's traffic roared past the little strip of lawn and the rusty blades of her mower caught and whirred and caught again until she pushed it harder, struggling to cut the long, damp grass, she had a premonition. Someday, she thought, Someday, there will be a day when I'll be able to sit down in the warm sun and read undisturbed. <laughs> that day has come. <clears throat> <laughs> My second poem is a good one for this month. I'm, I'm biased for this, the month of November. <clears throat> This poem is called, I Like November. I like the gray and woody way November leaves a filigree of trees stripped and fair on tiny tatters at their feet. Let it go. I like the gray and weary way November hunkers down to stubble in exhausted fields. Give it a rest. Spring is so insistent, summer so full of itself. Fall tries to feed everyone, but not November. November says, give it a rest. Make soup with what's left from the harvest. Find a good book and light a fire. It's almost dark. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Nicely done. Um, Next up is Jocelyn Bohr. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. This is my poem from the calendar. When I was a child, on this kind of summer night, first cool night with the breeze after eons of heat, that first moist air that cooled our bodies, the whole neighborhood would be outside after dark. Parents on porches talking, children running, collecting under street lamps, exchanging bragging rights about late bedtimes. And every window open and every fan spinning to draw that coolness inside for sleep, for comfort, when I was a child. For my second poem, and by the way, I'm Jocelyn Bohr from Grafton. Um, I'd like to thank um, our first reader, Lisa, for giving me a turn for this that I was house knowing. So here it is. The Museum of Notebooks is exhibited in my third dresser drawer, neatly stacked by size, unsorted by use or not. Blank notebooks quietly wait for my scribbling of thoughts and lists. Those partly used seem to mutter, wondering why they were put aside. Will new words ever appear? But those few, those very few I completely used with ink, leave the museum forever. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Next up is Katie Phillips. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. I'm Katie Phillips, and um, I am now living in the east side of Milwaukee after 40 years, almost 40 years in Waukesha. My, uh, and my calendar poem is about my, the home that I grew up in, in Wauwatosa, the house on Harding. If I were a ghost girl, I would gently haunt this house. The family would never say, we think they have a ghost, but instead tell neighbors the house is perfect without knowing why. The ghost girl I would be, shoes fly, fireflies into the backyard for children to chase. Breathes, breathes on the roses growing along the fence and keeps the screened in porch the perfect, the perfect temperature for the mom and dad to sit and watch kids play. I was told to turn off my webcam. So you're still there? Uh, nope, you can turn it back on and you still got, yeah, there we go. Okay, <laughs> I got a mess, a strange message. Um, the girl's girl, the ghost girl I would be Shoes fireflies into the backyard for children to chase, breathes on the roses growing along the fence, and keeps the green porch the perfect temperature for the mom and dad to sit and watch children play before bedtime. And if the pigtail girl sleeps on the porch on hot summer nights, the dark never seems scary. She never feels alone. And in the morning tells her brother, Crickets saying her to sleep. My second poem is by Janet Leahy, who um, Ed mentioned um, in the introduction of our uh, reading today. And she just loves this reading and she couldn't make it. So I told her I'd read her poem from the calendar. Jewels of memory on a night sky. My childhood home had an upstairs back porch from that vantage point, we looked north. The ritual each evening was to step out onto the porch to observe the stars, the moon, and the constellations in transit. One by one, others were called to come and see the dipper, pour out the North Star. My sister's bedroom held the door to the porch. Some mornings at the breakfast table, she would regale us with her stories of a sleepless night, the parade of family that had walked through her bedroom the night before, each voicing amazement at the some evening sky, each calling to whoever was still awake to come and see how the sliver of the sickle moon made a cradle 
for Venus. Come and see Orion's diamond-studded belt all aglow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie, and thanks for reading Janet's poem. Janet, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, the regional representative bef before I took over, and uh, I believe she was the uh, was instrumental in starting this uh, partnership with the library. Our next reader is Colleen Neighbor. Hi, I'm Colleen. I'm from Brookfield. My calendar poem is on page 88. In a small town with a cabbage processing plant, if a spare head drops off the back of a truck, a father will pull over to retrieve it and take it home to his loving wife, who will roll it with hamburger and rice to fill the children before he lights his cigar and snuffs the lamps in their rented duplex while the sons of German immigrants are stepping off the fields, scraping mud from their boots. They hang their tools and count the soft bills rolled in a butternut can before tomorrow and tomorrow's of lofting rocks and dropping seedlings. And in a smoky tavern, couples swirl brandy old fashions over plates of fried fish and slaw, trade butterick patterns, and talk Russian espionage in a city where seasons are counted by the smell of sweat and sacrifice and sauerkraut. My second poem is called Wisconsin Home. I summon the hot dish from Oma's table, sausages coiled in cast iron, home fries and linoleum, slow swirl of Marlboro smoke, Pastures of bovine, knob kneed and curious, snowdrifts, sled blades, red arrow skate ponds. I call forth mosquito bit skin, blue stem and black eyed Susan, loon cry over moonlit lake, badgers that burrow, the white tailed deer lifting eyes to headlights, her tribal heart, Kinnikinnick, Shawano, Oconomowoc. I recall kettles of whitefish over flame, lighthouses and white-winged museums, beaches too rocky for blankets, submarine races and cream city steeples, caves and quarries, an architect's prairie home. I crave hot dog carts and taco trucks, dream malt factories and QWERTY clapping, bulbs that crackle above rivers, brandy and bitters, Grappi and Glover, Schlemiel, Schlemazel, Beer Belly of Milwaukee, Burning Bright. They're friendlier there with their grills and fireworks the summer long and quicker with a handshake. Jello fluff arms and dad bobs, fleece lined and weathered, ready at moment's notice to carry you home. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Shlomil, Shlomazel, indeed. <laughs> Mary Ann Noe is next up. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Noe. I live in Waukesha, Wisconsin. My calendar poem is called My Mother's Funeral, and this is a true story. When you died, you led us, my daughter and me, to a shoe sale. What else you loved shoes so? Hats, too and sudden deliberate flamboyant language, champagne, municipal, mauled words giving permission to be said. We wore our new shoes, picked out by you from beyond. Deliberately, my daughter wore red lingerie. You smiled your approval, whispered to us, lingerie. My second poem uh, was, inspired by my two mile walk in the morning and it's called snorkeling in the street from the road i gaze up into the blue depths where ridges of clouds flow parallel row on row formed by tides and eddies of air far up in the depths hawks glide like manta rays wings rising and falling in slow ballerina grace triads of cranes and pods of starlings chatter like dolphins. 
in the shallows, close to the surface, near the road. Crowds of finches congregate like krill, twittering and swirling. And I, here bound to earth, adjust my snorkel, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, tread air. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mary Ann. Sorry that I mispronounced your name, but uh, we just met. Um, Karen Haley is our next reader. Hello, it's Karen from Milwaukee. Along the backpack pasture, there was wind, not much, just enough to stir the sun spattered needles of clustered dark pines, infused the air with the scent of resin, ancient and earthy. Under blue arching of sun and sky, my mind's eye catches a glimpse of the bare feet of childhood along a long ago row of green pines, pushing up small puffs of powder fine dust before the wind settles them, leaving only the round ripeness of remembering. My second poem, it's a little short reflection on this summer. I remember a time moving freely in my orbit. Such is the measure of my days in solitude, quiet repetition, my house a hermitage in a city held in siege. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, a, a past state poet laureate reading today, as far as I know, for the first time at our calendar reading. So I'd like to introduce now uh, Kimberly Blazer. Bonjour, everyone. Kim Blazer, Indigenous Cause. I'm Kim Blazer. I'm coming to you today from my library in Lyons Township in Wisconsin. and my uh, poem in this gathering in the in the uh, calendar is kind of about a different sort of home perhaps this song norway's arrow into full dark sky pine needles pillow my arm which pillows your head which roots against my breast until we settle suckling and nestling on the forest floor. And it starts just at the moment that my milk lets down the soft howling ache of wind song, a lonesome caress of sound through waving treetops, late September blowing a fiddler's bow across branch strings singing of some distant home, crooning vowels of ancient lullabies, blanketed by this ghostly loon chorus, together beyond ordinary breath or time, the pulse of your lips against my nipple, the rising rushing sound of souls passing, the falling away of words. And the second poem I'll read is from my just released in October new book, which is bilingual French and English, Résisté en dansante, Equinimi, Dancing Resistance. And I decided to read this one because we've just come out of this celebration of gratitude, which is how I like to think of Thanksgiving. And this is about gratitude. It, I mentioned Nathan Phillips who was the indigenous man who was confronted on the mall in DC by a bunch of young men when he was drumming. And so that's who that was, if you remember that news story. On the dignity of gestures for Nathan Phillips. One, remember hands ungloved and notched by life. Watch them pour stovetop coffee into tin cups lift cross poles onto fence bucks, mend nets, rock your children. 
to pay homage and speak the names of sweepers and shovelers, canners, cafeteria cooks, baby doctors, and deathbed watchers. Esme, Dale, Margaret, David, Mike, and Colleen. Three, receive all gifts, crocheted Afghan or prize money, humility. Gratitude spreads easy as butter, unworthiness endures. Four, watch the eyes of turtle, admire the neck courting of swan, study wing beats and tail rhythms, Note how otter sows stoop to lift pups. Listen to wind in fall, to trees bending and unbroken. Announce like spring frogs the unfolding of each holy year. Carry candles into cathedrals, poetry into prisons. Five. Do not become beast in the fray. Remember the indigenous hands that drummed on the man who stood calm. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Kippy Bednar is up next. Hello. Um, I'm Kippy Bednar. I live in Mabel, Wisconsin, and I am going to read a poem, my calendar poem, that is about a uh, particular area close to Mabel that I'm quite fond of. I'd like to visit. Uh, this is called Homebound. I take the familiar boardwalk along the Horicon Marsh. The sun warms my face, warms the turtles as they sit like stones along fallen trees. It is a dazzling sun a diamond pinned against a china blue sky. Yet the wind rushes in with cold daggers, slicing through the quiet cattails, pushing the serene clouds. I quicken my steps on the trail through the woods, rattling leaves submit and fly wildly, and the red-winged blackbirds complain and rush from the marsh grasses. And overhead, as the geese cut a path through the thinning season, their chorus echoes, time to go home, time to go home. And so I go. I'm gonna move my, I feel like the sun is there. That might help a little bit. <laughs> the sun was really blasting in there. So um, my second poem was um, published in the October um, uh, newsletter that I like to read and this is, um, this is a poem written um, in memory of my mother. It's called Frying Chicken and my grandmother. Frying Chicken. When I fry chicken in the oil of the cast iron pan, sizzling and browning crisply, I am my mother and her mother. The Louisiana days stay with them like their own heartbeat. Still moves their hands to create gumbo, grit, ste steaming bread pudding. Even with several moves over the years to rising California in the 40s and the quiet Midwest in the 70s, the ancestral thread holds taut. New Orleans, my mother's birthplace, with Creole dishes, jazz music that infiltrates the human nights, and stately mansions still sings within her, within her in a rural Wisconsin town. Thank you. Thank you, Kippy. Uh, our next reader is Kathy Giorgio. Hi, everyone. I am Kathy Giorgio from Waukesha, Wisconsin. And the first poem is from the calendar. It is a haiku called Afterglow. The sun on my bed drifts me to warm nights of play under a red quilt. For the second poem, I thought I'd be a little risky and offer up something that is brand new. Uh, and it is based on a walk I took with my daughter on the Fox River Walk, which is one of my favorite places. This is called Light, and it's a prose poem. 
So you walk with your daughter and there's the glow of fireflies and streetlight and starlight and moonlight and the bright white of paper against the cobbles. And you pick it up and read, will you go to heaven when you die? And you pitch it away just like you've been burned because you don't think you'll ever see that light. Or maybe you have, but it's not the light that's expected because sometimes the light's from within. Quiet. You walk for the hour that the dark really falls and it drapes on your shoulders, not like a shroud, but like earth's sigh on your skin. It's summer. You hear the quack of a duck and the peep of its babe and the throb of the frogs and the song of the cricket and loud splashes that scare you because there just might be gators, your daughter, or muskrats, you. There's the soft language of walkers and the smiles of strangers and one of them, God blesses you. And because you're polite, you say thank you. And who knows, it might help. And your laughter floats up like fireflies and streetlight and starlight and moonlight. This lit dark is a sigh you wear home. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our next reader is Karen Middleton. Hi, thank you, Ed. I'm Karen Middleton from Milwaukee. <clears throat> and my poem, excuse me, it's called the Bloom Drums from the Basement. It's a tight fit to get the bass drum with its floor pedal through the back door of the Toyota, but she manages. Then adds four more drums, cymbals, stands, a box of parts. The drums are lacquered, blue, dusty from being in the basement, but their heads are taut, make clear sounds when she taps them unintentionally. Later, as she starts the old Corolla, the vibrations commence, the five drums swish padding. At the bottom of the drive, she shifts out of reverse and the cymbals begin a feathery belling. The road ahead is wrinkled and pitted the drums note with a tone poem. The railroad tracks call for crescendo. If the drive to a store collecting instruments for needy children were a symphony, this flourish would indicate a high point, an emotional crisis, but the car crosses the tracks, the drums quieten, then the cymbals. In the lull, she remembers buying this drum set with her son, is insisting on this set's worth, it's good sound. It still sounds good, but she keeps driving them away from her basement, driving life away from percussion, away from any sound of impact. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next up is Tom Erickson. Where did I go? Where did I go? There you are. Am I on? I can't see. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, my first poem is from the calendar. It's called The Fall. My dog Edie and I are almost home when I slip and fall on the ice. It's one of those patches that form on the sidewalk from the dripping of a drain pipe. It's night, so I guess it's what they call black ice. Halfway through the step, I know I am going down. There's a moment when I am totally off the ground, my body parallel to the earth, and I'm peering straight up to the dark heavens. I'm thinking of all sorts of things. I'm seeing so many more hawks this winter. How oh, I really hope that squirrel proof bird feeder I got for Christmas works. How oh, Amish popcorn is better than regular popcorn. Something about the smaller husks. And then I hit the deck. Ooh, I'm kind of hurt. My glasses go flying and my stocking hat too. 
I'm still looking up at the stars, but I'm not so introspective anymore. I beckon Edie, thinking she will at least lick my face or sit by me. She stops and looks at me. Then she turns, walks down to the tree, pees, and starts walking home. All the stuff I do for her. My other poem, uh, which is in my new book called The Lawyer Chronicles, uh, I wrote this at the beginning of the pandemic, also as the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement was gaining momentum. It's called Zoom Court. It's confounding having a hearing while I'm sitting in my living room. I have a pandemic beard and unruly bangs, and I'm wearing boxer shorts while I position the camera just so to catch my face in my coat and tie. Within reach are framed photographs, books I have loved on the bookcase, my poetry journals. My client is on video from the jail, a young black guy wearing a white mask that gleams out of the, out of the green. The symbolism is so heavy, it makes me want to reach for my pen. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Scott Lowry is next. Hi. Let's see here. There we go. I'm Scott Lowry and I'm coming to you from East Wauwatosa this afternoon. Um, my calendar poem is written in response to a small woodblock print done by a friend of mine um, showing a small field in early winter uh, in the driftless zone, contour, plowed. Um, and I also had in mind another small field that I drove past for hundreds of times on my way into work that always looked carefully cultivated, although I never saw anyone working in there. It was kind of mysterious. Uh, contours after a woodblock print by D. Sipo. This frozen field has not come clean, not quite. The early snow is still too thin to fill between the curving furrows rise and fall. Their tool marks on a glaze of china white that spins and drifts to its brim of tangled willow. Beyond, stone bluffs flare briefly, then erase themselves, their hazy pinks fading to grays as light dries up in the creek bed silt below. Within a week or two, these tillage signs, entombed, swept smooth, will make one silent mound. Your life or mine could circle such middle ground, work blades tracing the arc of last year's lines, still carving earth from earth to make it new, while flocks of cars flash past without a clue. That's a sonnet. This next one uh, is a more recent poem. It's definitely not a sonnet, and it's kind of a different angle on the home theme. To my brother again, remember that Lionel train set? I can still feel the locomotive's dense heft, the nudge and twist it took to join the tracks, can hear the satisfying click when the switches worked. You'd be surprised too, I bet, so much intact where we left it in memory's storage space. Smoke pellets in their pill jar, faceless little men waiting for wooden milk cans at the siding. Here's dad swearing as his thick fingers try but fail to tighten sharp bright wire on stubborn screws. Tobacco haze sweetened by three in one oil ozone's silent sizzle and then how it finally ran on its own turn after turn dad switched off the overhead and there was the tiny headlight circling in the dark what we could see surrounded by all we could not thank you thanks scott very nice 
Next up is the other ed, ed block. Hello, Ed Block. I'm here. I'm waiting for the webcams to load. Oh, okay. Still loading. I've been seeing everybody just fine. I don't know why I shouldn't be showing up, but it says it's loading. Well, I'll go ahead and start, even though you can't see me. Thank you, Ed. Hello, everyone. This is Ed Block from Greendale. My calendar poem was originally titled Grandma Block. I changed it to a home. I think both titles work. The house, a walk up on the Polish south side, two near foundries, close by the lake, not far from bus and jewel, where Jay's potato chips, Azorns, an outside wall. Milwaukee Transit runs along the street of brick. The matriarch sits in her rocking chair in the downstairs sitting dining room, her stockings wool rolled down to calves and looking older than her years, complains of spells and shuffles to the antiquated bathroom near the coal chute and the cast iron furnace face. This next poem will appear in the annual report of the Mississippi River Valley Conservancy. In the Driftless, homage to Ben Logan. The watercress stays green all winter in the valley springs. The, along the ridges, prehistoric cliffs, and around more recent mounds, the birch and alder glow. The railroad ran through here a dozen decades in the past, through tunnels, over bridges, carrying grain and cattle, passengers and crews. Now the fog hangs heavy over sand mines, machinery dealerships, and fewer farms. The streams still flow and trout still swim, but now the storied past is less than dream. The hill country was full of voices when horses pulled the plows and women churned butter in the shade of milking sheds. Out here, a year is an arbitrary thing, unlike the changes of the moon, the coming of the snow, the coming of the spring. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Our next reader is Sarah Sarna. Hello. Um, my calendar poem is called, uh, sorry, I'm Sarah Sarna, I'm from Summit. My calendar poem is called Over the River, and uh, it's a little sadder to read now than it was back when I wrote it. So I'm hoping by the time we get to this point in the calendar next year, um, it's not sad anymore. <laughs> Over the river became southbound on the interstate, and grandmother's house was sold when she passed. A minivan does not handle snow as well as a sleigh. Sometimes progress is not progress, but it keeps us warmer, moves us faster to brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews. We who are smiled on from above by grandmothers and grandfathers, who hold not just the idea of family, but family itself tightly, who know this day is no guarantee of the next, understand time together is gift enough. So we gather. So I'm gonna lighten it up for my second poem. This is called Owl Speak. I can't see them in the dark, one to my left, one right. I stand still in the crisp night, listening to them converse, their hoo-hooing sounding clear and mournful. Though I don't speak owl, and admit they could be flirting. 
or telling owl jokes. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Next reader is Marjorie Payholm. Hi, I'm Marjorie Pagel from Franklin, Wisconsin. My poem is from one, page 135. It's called Dad's Green Coffee Cup. All day, every day, Dad's green coffee cup sat on the ledge of the wood-burning stove. His first cup from the bottom of yesterday's pot reheated at 5 a.m. when he got up for morning chores. Back from the barn to a fresh pot brewing, he and mom both liked it black and strong. Norwegian coffee, he said, not like the colored water so many people made. The smell of coffee perking in the aluminum pot, the stain on the rim of dad's cup, green milk glass, a collector's item now, still vivid in memory, 40 years after his last cup. My second poem is from my collection, Where I'm From. Uh, there was, and it's called The Girls with the Grandmother Faces. 30 years ago, an ardent feminist, I bristled when anyone referred to my friends and me as girls. Now though, I just smile. There's a group of us, pals since high school, who get together now and then. We are, like the title of that book, The Girls with the Grandmother Faces. You cannot tell in the Facebook photo which of us are widows, which losing eyesight or hearing, or who is bearing up in spite of illness, sorrow, worries about children, grandchildren, husbands. We are all smiling into the camera with brave and joyful faces celebrating friendships of half a century. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Oh my goodness. Before, uh, before I read my second poem, which will close out the festivities today, uh, I just want to remind people that submissions are open for the 2022 calendar. You can find the submission guidelines uh, on our website wfop.org and I want to thank all the readers uh, and uh, especially thank the people who tuned in. Uh, I hope it was a good experience and uh, one of the one of the things about these virtual readings um, one of the few things that I like about them is that they do allow people from different places and different areas uh, to come together and meet virtually. And so we had some first time readers here today and I'm happy for that. Uh, some long time participants did not join us and I'm sad about that. But hopefully next year we'll gather in the, um, in the rare books room of the Central Library in Milwaukee and, uh, you know, we'll get back to some semblance of normality. Uh, thanks to the library, to uh, to Jennifer and to Dan, and also to Lydia the, uh, for our, the technical assistance. And I'm going to finish up with my second uh, second poem, and it's a fairly recent poem, and it's called Bread. I'd like to think that we'll settle around the same table again, that we'll reach into the same basket again for bread, our fingers briefly touching and not even worry about it. I'd like to think we'll break that bread into pieces and press those pieces into the small saucer, the balsamic and olive oil anointing our friendship. I'd like to think that we'll read to each other in person again and laugh and cry together like we used to, that we'll inhale the same air into our various lungs and exhale our joy at being together again. But I don't know. I just don't know. Thank you, everybody.
Uh, see you again sometime soon, I hope. Bye bye. Oh, I forgot to I forgot to invite people to turn on their webcam. Thanks everyone for for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm gonna take a screen.